2016, two discoveries shook the world with the potential to overturn accepted theories about dinosaurs. The first was 99 million year old dinosaur feathers frozen in amber. It was the first time these feathers were found preserved in such excellent condition. The second was the discovery of a new species, Machimosaurus rex, thought to have lived 120 million years ago. It was the largest ever marine crocodile. The papers announcing these discoveries were co-authored by Japanese researcher Tetsuto Miyashita. At the age of just 16, Miyashita left Japan for Canada, intent on studying dinosaurs. Since then, he's traveled the world, unearthing the remains of these mighty giants. But more recently, he's turned his attention to fish. In this episode, we'll trace Miyashita's evolution from dinosaur-loving kid to dinosaur researcher to fish researcher. Tetsuto Miyashita is a promising young paleobiologist. In 2016, he was involved with two discoveries that shocked the world. The first find from a market in Myanmar was a piece of ancient amber with feathers inside. They turned out to be from a 99 million year old dinosaur tail. The tail is understood to have been that of a siluasaur, a bird-like dinosaur that walked on two legs. Other dinosaur feathers had been found before, but this was the first time such well-preserved feathers were known to have come from a dinosaur. Miyashita was instrumental in identifying the species of dinosaur these came from. Another big discovery was the largest sea-dwelling crocodile ever found, the Machimosaurus rex, found in Tunisia. This enormous croc is thought to have weighed three metric tons and been up to 10 meters long. That's as long as six human adults end to end. The species is regarded as having lived 120 million years ago and possibly surviving a climate change related mass extinction event even further back. Miyashita traveled to the site, joined in the excavation and co-authored the published findings. At Chicago's well-known Field Museum of Natural History, a specimen he worked on is on display. Um, I actually um, visited the original quarry from which this specimen was collected. Um, and uh, that was just a couple of years ago. My project was to take a GPS in my hand and uh, collect information from at which level in the stratigraphy this dinosaur came from. A true enthusiast, once he starts talking about dinosaurs, he finds it hard to stop. He's participated and published papers on numerous other excavations around the world. Having worked closely with him over the years, Professor Philip Curry has this to say about Miyashita. Well, I mean, there's no question that he's a very special person. Well, he, he clearly was actively involved in the sense that uh, even when uh, I met him first, of course, I, he presented me with a list of things he would love to do on, on research in dinosaurs. And this is a 16-year-old. He's getting opportunities now that um, are based on the fact that he has um, a 
good reputation and a solid publication record. Looking back from already a decade and a half at the forefront of dinosaur research, Miyashita, now 33, has always loved dinosaurs. When I was eight, the movie Jurassic Park came out, and my mom took me to the movie theater to watch this show. Jurassic Park was really the first movie that captured dinosaurs as a living, breathing animals. And um, that biological realities in that show, um, I think, really caught my attention. It all started when he was just four. Frequenting museums, Tetsuto Miyashita was already a hardcore dinosaur fan. Back in Tokyo, his parents share this remembrance. If you saw him, you knew this kid likes dinosaurs. You'd know right away. He wore dinosaurs. He had a hat. He was dinosaurs all over. And then came something that would define the path of young Tetsuto's future career. A Christmas present he got when he was 10. An illustrated book about dinosaurs. To the young aficionado, this was a treasure trove. It really had a different taste from any other dinosaur books that I had. It's about the, um, what it's like to work on dinosaurs and what it's like to be a dinosaur researcher. You know, you can tell that I read this book many a time. I mean, like, you know, see how this book aged. The book's co-author, Professor Philip Curry, is known around the world for helping establish the now accepted idea that dinosaurs were the ancestors of the birds we see today. Miyashita's admiration for Curry was immediate. You know, he, he really was a childhood hero to me. Um, you know, in every sense that the word hero captures. Um, you know, I was just 10 years old, but, um, you know, after reading this book, I not only wanted to know more about dinosaurs, but also wanted to work with him. I, went, I wanted to, um, you know, move to Canada and work and live alongside with him and become a dinosaur researcher like he is. When he was 14, he sent Curry a letter saying, I'd like to come work with you in Canada. Curry's reply said, welcome. Unable to contain his excitement, Miyashita promptly took a bold step. I got in touch with Phil first and I asked, asked him if I could come and, you know, work in the museum. And I got in touch with the, um, with the principal of a local high school and asked him if I could get transferred over to their school. Hearing out of nowhere about their son's sudden and determined steps, his parents were taken aback. His school contacted us because he hadn't been attending. He wanted to drop out of school here and go study in Canada. At 16, Miyashita left Japan mid-semester and set out for the Great White North. Curry had replied to Miyashita's letter, but didn't expect the boy would actually move all the way to Drumheller, Canada. So uh, when he moved, uh, I remember being a little bit shocked uh, that, uh, wow, he actually did it. <laughs> Uh, because it just seemed so sudden all of, all, all of a sudden. I mean, it was less than a year from, from the time when he first uh, outlined the idea to the time when he actually showed up in Drumheller. <laughs> Once in Canada, he split his time between a local high school and helping out at the Royal Tyrrell Museum where Curry worked. I 
did everything. You know, the organizing papers, his library, um, preparing illustrations for the papers, um, you know, looking at new issues of journals to look for um, important papers. There are so many things to do in the uh, paleontology lab. And, you know, I had my hands on every possible thing that I could. After graduation, he followed in Curry's footsteps, enrolling at the University of Alberta. From then on, his days were spent traveling the world, digging up dinosaurs. How amazing is that? Tetsuto Miyashita now works just out of Canada at the University of Chicago. When we arrive, he seems preoccupied by fish. Sure, modern birds come from dinosaurs, but not fish, right? What are you looking at? So um, these are zebra fish. They are experimental models for the, uh, the vertebrate development. Feeling somewhat constrained with the traditional approaches for excavating and analyzing dinosaur fossils, Miyashita is augmenting his research with studies of how living animals evolve. He's using these zebrafish to investigate how vertebrates came to have jaws. And he's using genome editing equipment. It allows the genes in living organisms to be altered or even removed. Yashta injected these fertilized zebrafish eggs with a red substance that deletes genes related to the joints that open and close the jaw. And the result was this, a functionally jawless zebrafish. The permanently open mouth is much wider than that of a regular zebrafish. He says he didn't expect them to survive. I thought that they wouldn't be able to feed and then they would die. So what they do instead is they swim around with their mouth open and then just swim through the lump of food. Moreover, these jointless wide-mouthed zebrafish are similar to another kind of fish. And an ancient one at that. This fossil, found in northern Canada, is an anaspid, a fish that lived around 430 million years ago before fish had jaws. Above is the jaw jointless zebrafish's skeleton. Below is the fossilized anaspid. You can see a wide open mouth, a flatter nose, and other traits they have in common. So what does this mean? Well, there are two things. The number one is that just because of this overall similarity, these mutant zebrafish can give us some insights about how these jawless vertebrates in a fossil record might have lived. So the second thing is that development is capable of producing the forms that are not written exactly in the genome, right? And then this is called plast plasticity. Plasticity means flexibility. In this case, the ability of an animal to alter its form or behavior to suit a given environment. With their jaw joints missing, the zebrafish compensated by gaining the ability to feed with their mouths continually open. Miyashita speculates that plasticity was a critical factor in jaw evolution.
But why is he studying Jaws in the first place? It was a really key innovation in evolution of the vertebrates. So when you look at the modern vertebrate diversity, it includes all the fishes all the way to the humans, mammals, right? The 99.8% so of all the living vertebrates have some kind of jaws. So the jaws were the key for this great success that the vertebrate animals enjoy today. Having a jaw allowed a fish to ingest and chew its prey. But that didn't prevent its prey from fleeing, which is how the fish also came to develop a heart and a brain. Along with the jaw, these organs gave the fish the intelligence and physical strength needed to hunt after its prey, or so we believe. In the future, he hopes to apply his findings to a history of dinosaur evolution. Previously fixated on dinosaurs, Tetsuto Miyashita now studies other animals too. That change was brought on by collaborative research on zebrafish conducted by University of Alberta evolutionary biologist Richard Palmer. He well remembers Miyashita in his college days. His window only included dinosaurs. There weren't any other animals of interest. And I think, I mean, I, I, I take some credit for introducing him to, you know, some of the variety of animals that you see in this lab, along with stories about them and how they work. And because of his interest in dinosaur morphology and function, I think that really resonated with him. For ambitious student Miyashita, Professor Palmer's words were devastating. It was, you know, you're looking at this something for a long time, but then suddenly there was a light coming from a different directions. And I just realized that how, how much we just don't know and how, how many profound questions are still out there that we can ask just in addition to dinosaurs. After this realization, he often visited Palmer with more questions. He would come up and ask the kind of questions that only someone who was really interested in the material and also had a fair background knowledge about, about zoology would ask. And so I just, like I say, it, he instantly made a very strong impression on me and that's what motivated me to stay in touch with him. And he started off studying dinosaurs under his childhood idol, paleontologist Curry, and then learned about other animals from evolutionary biologist Palmer. His current research is a fusion of their approaches. Rich taught me how to think about science and how to approach science. And um, the Phil, um, I, I learned from him um, how to do the research, right? The actual discipline and um, you know, attitude toward work and uh, how a professional should be. Having learned from his mentors, Tetsuto Miyashita's next move was to the University of Chicago. It was the perfect place to broaden his perspective by interacting with researchers in other fields. It is important to understand about things that uh, open up doors for all of us. He attends weekly evening seminars. This is a cross-discipline discussion with experts in organismal biology and anatomy geology, and ecology and evolution. When we first got there, we thought we had one mouse that was taking over the entire forest. And we're like, this thing is so pro prolific, taking every, over everything. Tonight's topic is mice that live in South America's Atlantic forest. By capturing mice to gauge their habitat, they hope to learn more about changes to the global environment. So it's a bit of a follow-up to uh, his question, but uh, is there any measure for the efficacy of traps? Uh, Miyashita isn't shy about asking questions outside his areas of expertise. It 
totally makes my research much better, much richer, much broader in scope, and more insightful, and making it more relevant to gro broader community of people. So uh, this is really essential part of being at the uh, University of Chicago. He cites three professors here of particular inspiration to him. One is paleontologist Michael Coates, who uses fossils to study how sharks have evolved. Coates analyzes 3D images of fossils with computed tomography, CT scans. And he uses 3D printers to reproduce shark skeletons. Coates says, the distinctive genetics of endangered shark species are an important resource for biodiversity studies. Another inspiration is developmental biologist Victoria Prince. Like Miyashita, she uses zebrafish, but to investigate brains and nervous systems. She's interested in the changes that occur in brain and nerve cells during the 24 hours it takes for fertilized eggs to develop into zebrafish. Prince says this research is also of use for diseases in humans, such as diabetes. And the third inspiration Miyashita cites is evolutionary biologist, Urs Schmidt Ott. He uses flies and mosquitoes to explore evolution. He's investigating the genes that govern embryonic development in insects. He says this research is a key to understanding evolutionary processes in animals. Miyashita wants to make his own research more meaningful through his discussions with these specialists. They've taken note of his encompassing approach. Tetsudo is one of a new generation of scientists whose combination of uh, ability to work with um, living organisms and look at development in living organisms and also studying vertebrate paleontology at a high level is relatively rare. Tet's a very bubbly person in a great way. So he always seems to be happy and he has a real passion for the research. He comes with a very different background, which I find tremendously enriching for myself because I don't have a paleontological record or, 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 or um, background. Today, evolutionary biologist Christopher Lowe is visiting the University of Chicago from Stanford. Miyashita convinced him to collaborate. Their new research uses a scanning electron microscope, which can magnify things hundreds of thousands of times. They're looking at acorn worms, earthworm-like creatures that live in the sediment on the seabed. They're taking cross-section images with the microscope in hopes of producing a 3D model of the worm's nervous system. Is they don't have an obvious brain. They have a lot of neurons, but they're spread out across the whole of their skin. And by looking at that in an animal that doesn't have a classic brain, what this tells us about, not only about origin of vertebrates, but then also about the origin and the evolution of nervous system in general, and origins in brains. They hope that detailed 3D images of the nervous systems of these brainless creatures will help us understand where brains come from. But 
What led Miyashita from the jaw to the brain? So when you think about the, uh, what enabled vertebrates to become a very active predators, then those are the, the jaws. But then it's not just the only thing that makes the vertebrate successful group of animals. Um, it's also the, uh, a highly developed nervous system. To hone in on the evolution from a nervous system to a brain, he'll use insights gleaned from his associates to formulate a new approach. You're not going to answer it purely by molecular biology or by paleontology or by comparative anatomy in living animals. And uh, Tetsuto is a, is a long way along that path of actually being able to master all of those different aspects of biology in order to answer challenging questions. And that's partly why we all got together. Miyashita wants to do even more collaborative research to further enrich his understanding. But in the end, he plans to return to dinosaurs. Eventually, I want to bring this all back into dinosaurs. Of course, um, you know, the dinosaurs are like, um, you know, almost like my first love. So, um, you know, maybe um, I'm not working on them every day now, but eventually, what I learn, um, what I um, gain as a skill by looking at the, uh, the fossil fishes will come back to um, help me understand dinosaurs in a slightly different way than I used to do before. In March 2020, his two-year term at the University of Chicago comes to an end. Next, he plans to take up a post at the Canadian Museum of Nature. So Miyashita, a young researcher whose path led him from dinosaurs to biology and beyond. Someday when he comes home to dinosaurs, he'll surely have some innovative ways to study them.